Hey guys and welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Phil Richards. In today's video we're going to be talking about all you need to get started with observation of the shoulder joint. We're going to be breaking our observation into an anterior, a posterior and a lateral view. And we're going to be highlighting key traits and pathologies such as shoulder impingement syndrome as we go. So as to not slow your video down, we're not going to be comparing the affected and unaffected shoulders. But of course in practice we always want you to compare the two to inform your patient diagnosis. So when we're thinking about specific shoulder observation, there's something else we have to do first. We have to look for key inflammatory signs and bony deformity because it doesn't matter what joint we're looking at, we need to look for those things. And in case you've forgotten your key inflammatory signs, they're redness, swelling and bruising. So there are five key presentations in which you are highly likely to find inflammatory signs that every good clinician should be aware of. Number one is a trauma. With any trauma, your patient may suffer bony or soft tissue injury, such as a fracture or a ruptured muscle. Expect to find either swelling, bruising or deformity when observing the joint. For more severe cases, you may find more than one of these signs present. Number two is a bursitis which put simply is inflammation of a bursa. Some bursae are more easily seen when they are inflamed. For instance, elecronon bursitis, or student's elbow, can be easily visualized as the bursa is right beneath the subcutaneous layer of the skin. Others are not so easily visualized due to their anatomy. For instance, subacromial bursitis, where the bursa in question lies in a relatively deep position underneath the acromion. The amount of swelling seen therefore varies based on the anatomical site and the severity of inflammation. In the event of a bursitis, you may see redness on the skin and feel warmth on palpation. Always consider whether this could have been caused mechanically or whether an infection is responsible, in which case your patient may be systemically unwell. Number three is a tendonitis. When you look at the tendon in question, your patient may get swelling and redness in the most severe forms. Be aware though, don't rule out tendonitis if these signs are not present. You should also rely on your objective tests and mechanical signs. Number four is an infection or a cellulitis, where you may find redness or swelling, or in progressed cases even pus in the area of infection. Furthermore, look at your patient as a whole. Do they feel unwell or do they have a temperature? Finally, number five is arthropathies which can be categorized into osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and crystal arthritis. For osteoarthritis, you may expect to find an enlarged swollen joint, and in progressed cases, you may find hard swelling when you palpate the joint. With rheumatoid arthritis, you may find redness or swelling at the joint you are assessing, as well as other joints, particularly the hands and the feet. The onset of rheumatoid arthritis is insidious, so if your patient history indicates an absence of trauma, this should be considered a potential pathology. If you suspect this condition, you may wish to liaise with your patient's GP to conduct blood tests to rule out raised inflammatory markers. Crystal arthropathies represent a group of conditions associated with the deposition of mineralized material, mimicking crystals within joints and surrounding tissues. Gout and pseudogout are some of the most recognizable forms. These conditions present typically in a single large joint with redness and swelling and may well be warm to palpate. Like with rheumatoid arthritis, the important things to bear in mind are whether or not the onset of symptoms can be linked to a mechanical cause and whether mechanical aggravating or easing factors can be associated with the patient's symptoms. If not, a crystal arthropathy should be considered and the patient should consult with their GP for further investigation. So those are our inflammatory signs. Let's get into the main video. So now we're going to look at our observation of the shoulder joint in the anterior view. So there's two key things we want to look at in the anterior view. One is a deviation from the midline and the other is the shoulder position. So if when we're looking at our patient, we notice that they're sort of laterally flexed across this way, then this depending on which shoulder you're looking at that's got the problem, we can hypothesize reasons why that may be an issue. So for instance, if Marie's got right-sided shoulder pain, we might find that this is a posture because she's been trying to find a way of creating more space. Or it may be 
that um, on the opposite side, because of a postural position at work or something, we've ended up more stuck in this posture. And now this arm is not very easy to lift up because of the relative compression stuck down on that side. So that's the importance of looking to see about the lateral flexion from left to right. Now, if we think about the shoulder position, we want to think about whether they're level or whether the scapula is too elevated or depressed and also in and out, so protraction, retraction, if it's too far this way or that way. So if we think about an elevated trapezius and we've got affected uh, shoulder on this side, so the pain's on this side, well, there's a few situations where this might occur. One is with a rotator cuff problem where we've not got enough power and stability here and the upper trapezius is trying to join in. The other common one is with a frozen shoulder where they've lost movement in their joint capsule here. So they're having to really kind of hoik their shoulder around in whatever way they can. And they've done it for so long, it's actually stayed hypertonic and elevated because of that. So that would be an example of the elevation issue. If it's too depressed, so it's dropped down this way, we, and they're getting pain on this side, it could be because there's not enough postural tone coming through, supporting, um, and that would include the upper trapezius. So as the shoulder's trying to lift up, it just doesn't really have the power from here to lift up. So that could be a reason that we're getting pain. A super common one is excessively protracted position. This is one that's gonna come up time and time again. Now the main reason this happens is with a pec minor dysfunction. So the pec minor that's protracting becomes very short and tight and it won't allow the shoulder to move around a lot. So that can cause problems when the patient's trying to move. And also when they contract, it can contract so strongly here, it sends dysfunction in other areas of the muscles that can't keep up with it. Because we're gonna have a relative shortening here, but stuff on the back on the posterior aspect is gonna get lengthened out. And over time that may become weak and dysfunctional. More rarely, if someone is excessively retracted, that's, um, more likely to be associated with pain in and around the scapula, but also just from what we said at the front, if it's too short and tight here, it can cause problems. Also at the back, if it's short and tight there, that can cause an imbalance as you try and move your shoulder around. So that could be a clue too. So now we're gonna look at observation of the shoulder joint in the lateral view. And in this situation, there's two key things we're gonna look at here. One is going to be the relationship between the cervical and the thoracic spine. So this kind of pokey chin posture we talk about where if we just get Marie to come forward here and slump here, we have this very sort of habitual posture that a lot of us adopt, um, which can be okay, but it also is a leading cause of many shoulder problems. So why would that be? Well, when we're in this position here, if Marie starts to try and move her shoulder around, we've created less space around the subacromial area. So the tendons have a lot less room to work. Um, and progressively over time, if they get more irritated in our older population, they're gonna become thicker as well. So we now have thicker tendons and thicker tissue and a small space. So you can imagine those two things don't go very well together and you're gonna get a lot of irritation. The second one is to do with the relative anterior posterior translation of the humeral head on the glenoid fossa. So what does that mean? So the easiest way to measure and look for it is you get your fingertips like so, so your thumb and your first finger, and you clasp around the spine of the scapula and the acromion on the edge there, the anterior aspect. And then you get your other two fingers and you come across onto the humeral head and you're looking at how far the humeral head is in relation to this. So we can kind of get an idea if it's gone too far forwards or too far back. So what would that mean? Well, if the humeral head, which commonly migrates forwards, because we're so pec and lat dominant, and remember that inserts into the front of the shoulder, it has a lovely way of internally rotating the humerus and dragging it anteriorly. So if we have that situation, we're now creating a, a situation where all the tendons are getting a lot more compressed and irritated and dominant in the front. So now we're going to complete our observation of the shoulder joint in the posterior view. So similarly, like we looked at in the anterior view, if the patient is relatively side flexed, we can still have exactly those same issues come up again as we'd already talked about. So from here, one of the first things you just want to briefly consider is shoulder dominance. So normally, this doesn't work every time, but a dominant shoulder, you're gonna find that the trapezius bulk 
is if they've been training or they're a gym type person, you're gonna see it almost looks higher than the opposite side. But the other clue that matches with it is they have a higher relative upper trapezius, but a lower spine of scapula. So if we look at our patient here, we've got a spine of scapula here, and then the other one up here. So I would hypothesize if I asked, are you right-handed? And they say yes. Now, chances are they're right-handed anyway, but this is also a really good clue um, as to what's happening. Also, if you think about it, if this is the normal presentation of a dominant shoulder and they don't have it, so for instance, their dominant shoulder is a lot higher, that would actually imply there's been some sort of dysfunction because we wouldn't normally see that. So that's something to also consider. So if I looked at this person, I said, oh, you're left-handed. And they go, no, no, I'm right-handed. I would actually think, ah, there's probably an issue here actually because I would expect it to be lower. Moving on from that, uh, scapular winging. So there's two types, there's true winging and pseudo winging. So a true winging, um, which I won't be able to perform for you, is when the medial border of the scapula just literally kind of pulls out and round. And it's not really changeable with movement or correction. And the reason for this is a long thoracic nerve palsy. Uh, whilst this is recovering and under medical management, you're not necessarily going to just expect some serratus anterior exercises to resolve the situation. It will be very clear in the presentation as well. You won't be looking at it thinking, is it winging? Is it not winging? It's going to be very marked and obvious, especially if they try and perform an active movement and the scapula can't support itself. You're going to see it just bend out potentially even further. Now, pseudo winging is either at rest or when they move, you can almost get your fingers round a bit um, and feel like the gapping underneath it. Now that's normally linked to a muscle imbalance and a lot of the time serratus anterior or lower trapezius activation is blamed for this pseudo winging. In clinical practice, it's important to recognize that the imbalance may be there, but in terms of function, it doesn't necessarily follow that some winging means that they're gonna have dysfunction there. You can ask them to do resisted movements you can get cables, bench press, whatever you like, and they aren't particularly weak in that area. So bear it in mind, even though you see it, it may not be dysfunctional. It may just be an imbalance that doesn't cause dysfunction. From that, we want to think about the scapular position in general. So if we think about the basics it can do, it can either be elevated, depressed, protracted, retracted, upwardly rotated, or downwardly rotated. So whenever we see a shift or an asymmetry from one side to the other, we wanna be thinking about what muscle group might be doing that. So if we see something particularly retracted, then we're thinking, ah, maybe rhomboids are overactive. And then we might think, well, okay, if they're overactive and strong here, what's happening at the front? Has this become weak and lengthened or is this becoming painful and tight and strong? Similarly, if we think about upper trapezius overactive there, then the patients, if that's their starting position, they've already lost their, uh, their dynamic ability to move and recruit the upper trapezius to cause an upward rotation. So that would be another clue. From there, the last point I'd like to make is if you see a bilateral problem here, so both shoulders are excessively elevated or both excessively depressed, that could give you a problem, not a problem, an idea that something's wrong more centrally, maybe at their, their core, for instance. So a common one I'll see in clinic a lot is someone that's had a history of low back pain for 15 years. And what's happened is they've learned to elevate both upper trapezius and really work from here so they can completely avoid activity down here. So if something like that's been happening over a long time, then the way to resolve their shoulder pain to get this to relax, to normalize, is you might have to delve a little bit into their back history and go for a bit more of a global approach. So, let's summarize this video on observation of the shoulder joint. In standing, break down your observation of the shoulder into an anterior, lateral, and posterior view. Remember to compare both affected and unaffected sides. When observing your patient, look for deformity and inflammatory signs, which are redness, swelling, and bruising. You can also look for signs of specific pathology in each view, as mentioned throughout the video. And that concludes our video on observation of the shoulder joint. From here, we suggest you check out our other videos in the clinical physio catalog, such as active range of motion testing and passive range of motion testing at the shoulder joint. Guys, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you again soon on clinical physio.